Our second uh, talk in the afternoon session is by Boris Dubrov uh, from the other side of Zoom. Uh, so, non holonomy generalization of Kaylee's role cubic, please. Thank you. Thank you, Boris. And uh, thanks a lot for the opportunity to take part in this workshop, even remotely. So, um, Kaylee's uh, role cubic uh, did appear uh, in uh, a number of works recently. And I thought it might require some more attention, uh, both this uh, historic and uh, part of uh, Kelly's real cubic itself, its uh, basic um, geometric and algebraic properties, as well as how one can generalize it to a um, larger class of surfaces, but uh, naturally uh, related to Kelly's real cubic. So, Let's probably start uh, speaking about uh, what it is. Oh, Kaylee's uh, root cubic is actually a surface in P3. So it's a two dimensional surface in three dimensional projective space. So this is a equation in uh, affine coordinates, very simple one. Uh, so apart from uh, this minus X cubed by three, it's just uh, the equation or from, uh, a quadratic surface, quadric in P3. So it is uh, ruled by lines. So this is why it's called ruled cubic. So these are equations of all these lines. We just take X to be a constant and different constants and get uh, a family of uh, lines. Uh, it's not smooth, uh, that's very important. Uh, well, uh, we have this equation in projective coordinates, and then we can easily derive that uh, it has a singular locus. But actually, it is clear that it is uh, not smooth because by a famous uh, uh, theorem of Solomon, we know that any smooth cubic would have exactly 27 lines on it, at least in complex uh, field, uh, while here we have infinitely many lines. So it is already clear that that, that is not correct. Uh, that is, this service cannot be smooth. Uh, uh, well, it is hyperbolic outside of singularity locus. So it has a non-degenerate second fundamental form of signature one, one of Neutral signature. This is all basic properties very easily seen observed from the equation itself. Uh, a, a bit more of advanced properties. Um, so as it is a hyperbolic surface, it has two asymptotic directions at each point, at each non-singular point. And therefore we have uh, two families of asymptotic curves tangent to these directions. So one of these families is this um, uh, lines, and this is uh, in general true for any ruled surface uh, uh, of uh, hyperbolic type. The second family is, uh, is also very nice. These are not no longer uh, lines, but uh, rational uh, curves in P3, and this is a complete family of, of, of these rational curves uh, that are asymptotic curves for our uh, Kaley's real surface. So it is, uh, I'd say, it, it is ruled by lines and by on one side and by uh, rational curves on the other side. Uh, Another very important property, it has actually three-dimensional symmetry algebra of projective transformation. So I, in these coordinate representations, this will turn out to be a fine transformations, but well, in general, we view Kaley's surface, uh, Kaley's cubic uh, surface uh, from the projective uh, viewpoint. And actually, uh, this is one of the ways to characterize Kaley's uh, surface. It is a unique uh, uh, hyperbolic hypersurface in P3 with three-dimensional infinitesimal, infinitesimal symmetry, or to be precise, locally unique. So if you have any any such hypersurface with uh, three-dimensional infinitesimal symmetry, then it has to be locally equivalent to Kaley's cubic with some projective transformations. And I recall that uh, a, a quadric would have six dimensional symmetry, a hyperbolic quadric would have six dimensional symmetry, which is isomorphic to a SO2 tool. So this is one of the ways I would try to generalize. So Kelly's surfaces based on this characterization. Uh, another uh, viewpoint on Kelly's surface is coming from, uh, well, actually a bit of a history here. Uh, 
And I, I found out, uh, and that's freely available, a paper, regional paper uh, by uh, Dr. Kelly uh, from 1868, uh, where he classifies all cubic surfaces. Uh, it's probably less known than the classification, classification of elliptic curves on normal equations for elliptic curves. Uh, for cubic surfaces, it's very much more complicated. You see 23 classes. Uh, the first one starts with, uh, uh, includes smooth uh, cubic surfaces. And these are exactly ones that, where we have this 27 lines. And then, uh, all others are not smooth. They have some singularities uh, up to like most degenerate, but still uh, irreducible cubic surface, which is number 23. And this is exactly our uh, cubic uh, uh, ruled cubic ruled. Yeah, ruled cubic here. So it's from Kelly's point of view, that would be the most degenerate in uh, his classification list. Uh, Another morning mark, I, I, I took time for me to find out what is FRS, RS abbreviation after uh, uh, Professor Kelly's name. So it's a fellow, fellow of Royal Society here. So this is how it used to be at that time. So now let's look at a slightly different approach to Kelly's ruled cubic. It is uh, coming from the uh, geometry of partial differential equations. So first of all, just consider this fairly simple uh, class of PDs, uh, linear PDs on uh, linear homogeneous PDs on, uh, on one function U of uh, two independent variables X and Y. It is, uh, you see that uh, U, X, Y is actually missing here. And this is why uh, if you would want to uh, understand how many uh, solutions are here in general, if the system turns out to be compatible, there are natural compatibility conditions. So you, you would need to ensure that the first equation differentiated twice by Y is the same one as the second one differentiated twi by, twice by X. Uh, but assuming this, uh, uh, compatibility conditions are satisfied. We actually have a four-dimensional uh, solution space. It is a linear space because our system is linear homogeneous. Its solution is uniquely determined by u, ux, uy, and uxy at any point. Uh, so suppose we've chosen any uh, uh, set of solutions or any basis in this solution space. Uh, so u0 to u3 here. And then we can use this uh, basis as homogeneous uh, coordinates uh, for a certain surface in P3. Uh, it turns out that the surface will necessarily be hyperbolic. And moreover, uh, it will have asymptotic curves given by uh, uh, fully, well, being, being uh, coordinate directions in X and Y uh, directions. So, uh, and this is this actually uh, is explained uh, by the fact that we have no x uh, u x y here present. So it's also a choice of a nice coordinate system uh, on the hypersurface on the surface itself. And it is clear since the basis of the solution space is uh, um, not unique, uh, then our hyperbolic surface uh, uh, is also. Uh, can only be determined up to any projective transformations. And actually, uh, this is a one-to-one -one correspondence. Whenever we have hyperbolic surface in P3, we can uh, uh, choose coordinates X and Y on it such that we have nice alignment with uh, asymptotic directions. And then uh, choose uh, uh, homogeneous coordinates, any homogeneous coordinates and choose take, take uh, individual uh, co homogeneous coordinate as a function, then you can build a unique system uh, as above that corresponds to this hypersurface. So it's in a way one-to-one -one correspondence between 
uh, hyperbolic hypersurfaces in PC viewed after projective transformations and equations of this kind above. Uh, this is a classical theory coming back, I think, again to Wilczynski's works, but also um, uh, was uh, it was heavily used uh, in uh, geometric study of uh, surfaces in P3, and this generalizes to PN in, in general in uh, uh, the works of Sasaki and his collaborators. Uh, so then, uh, but it's, as expected, so if you take a trivial system, it would correspond to a quadrant because the solutions will be uh, one x, y, and x, y. So then there would be something, uh, there would be uh, exactly the coordinate representation of a hyperbolic quadric. Uh, if we uh, would uh, slightly deform the system and write uxx equal to uy instead of zero, then we would end up exactly with the coordinate representation of Achilles uh, ruled cubic. So from this point of view, we may think about uh, Achilles ruled cubic as a, as, a, as a certain deformation of a trivial a uh, system of PDs of the above kind. And uh, this is uh, where we start from uh, in uh, towards generalization of Keyless uh, ruled uh, surface. So, well, it's again, it, it's of course a game of words, holonomic versus non-holonomic, but uh, uh, the motivation is as follows. So what we are going to do, we are going to replace two asymptotic directions on a two-dimensional surface, but by two kind of asymptotic directions on a three-dimensional manifold, such that they would span a contact plane. So they will no longer be, if you take two vector fields along these directions, they will no longer compute. Uh, so what we are going to do, we'll replace uh, partial derivatives by x and y with uh, action of non-commuting vector fields. Uh, x is dx and y is dy plus x dz on a three-dimensional space. So we have x, y to be dz. Uh, and then we'll write a very similar system. So we'll have a system of uh, linear PDs of exactly the same form when I have partial derivatives um, uh, uh, by x and y replaced uh, by um, lead derivatives along vector fields x and y, non-commuting vector fields. All the rest will, will stay absolutely the same. Oh, well, we'll have one more coordinate. So we'll be dealing with three-dimensional manifolds, uh, uh, contact manifolds rather than two-dimensional surfaces. Uh, so again, uh, what would happen if you try to uh, build a solution space for such system and would understand uh, what kind of embedding we would get if you follow the same idea? So this, this is what actually happens. So first of all, the, well, again, we have to assume that we have all compatibility conditions satisfied. And here to check that this compatibility conditions satisfied, we would need to go up to six derivatives actually, because X and Y no longer computing, uh, but there are still relations between X and Y in particular, because they, uh, both of these vector fields compute with DZ. Uh, still, if, uh, if these compatibility conditions are satisfied, then we can check that uh, the system actually uh, has a dimensional solution space. Where again, we can find out uh, that this freedom comes from uh, these terms that would stay free uh, when we prolong such system. So it's u, x, u, y, u, et cetera, up to z squared u by z, I denote the vector field d by dz. Uh, so what does this mean? This means, again, if you choose an arbitrary basis in a solution space, we'll end up with a three-dimensional submanifold in P7, again, because the solution space is not, uh, the, the basis is not unique. This will be um, well-defined only after projective transformations in P7. So by just switching from um, commuting partial derivatives in X, Y to non-commuting actions along two vector fields, uh, capital X and capital Y, uh, we uh, change, we go from surfaces in P3 to three-dimensional submanifolds in P7. 
So what kind of submanifolds are this? Uh, so how we can, how, how to characterize or understand this kind of submanifolds. And uh, to do uh, this, we start with a trivial system. So let's just look at, at the most trivial system we have. Very easy to solve. Uh, this is a solution space. So we got eight, uh, eight dimensional solution space with the following basis as expected. Uh, then we, well, this, this eight functions uh, don't say much immediately, but if you start computing, sim computing symmetry algebra, for example, it turns out to be 17 dimensional and um, uh, again, easily decomposable into reductive uh, subalgebra acting uh, on an abelian ideal. Um, and this eight dimensional abelian ideal corresponds exactly to shifts along the solutions. Well, our system is linear, so any shift along the solution will be a symmetry. Uh, and, and then we understand that actually uh, there will be an irreducible action of a GL3 uh, on this eight dimensional ideal. So using this, we grasp and then verify that actually what we get is exactly the uh, uh, so this action of GL3 and R8 is uh, the same as joint action of a cell three plus some modification of central uh, element. Uh, and therefore the uh, submanifold, the three dimensional submanifold in P7 is nothing but uh, the highest weight orbit of the joint action of a cell three uh, R on P7, which is a projectivization of a cell three R. And again, uh, we can all, well, we can come up with lots of other uh, ways to understand uh, this variety. For example, like uh, we speak about uh, uh, elements of a cell three R viewed up to uh, uh, multiplication and uh, uh, highest weight would be uh, highest weight element or highest root element would be uh, just uh, uh, an important element of rank one. So what we speak here is uh, just an important uh, uh, or rank one matrices sitting inside um, SLCR. So it's another characterization of uh, this uh, uh, three dimensional variety sitting in P7. So, uh, and uh, again, uh, this is what would replace uh, uh, our uh, hyperbolic quadric in what we discussed before. So a non-holonomic analog of our um, uh, hyperbolic quadric uh, would be now uh, a highest uh, root orbit uh, uh, of the joint action of a cell three. Uh, so now we can actually try to deform it. And I especially, I especially put epsilon here to show that this is a deformation parameter here. Again, plays the same role, find an eight dimensional uh, solution space. And I specified which extra terms we get as deformations uh, um, uh, of uh, what we had before. So it's very explicitly written here. And uh, so what we got is uh, actually, uh, again, a three dimensional submanifold in P7 which uh, can be viewed as a deformation of the highest weight orbit of the joint representation of a cell three. And uh, it turns out that all this, for if epsilon is not zero, then all this uh, uh, serve, or all this three dimensional manifolds are equivalent, uh, but non-trivial. Non-trivial means they're not equivalent locally via projective transformations to the joint orbit itself. So, uh, in fact, what we'll get, uh, we'll have four dimensional symmetry algebra. It's a simple computation uh, from the dimension of the symmetry of PDs to the dimension of the symmetry of uh, um, the uh, submanifold or embedded submanifold itself, because we have to kill all trivial uh, symmetries coming from the solutions. So we see that we get, we go down from eight dimensional symmetry of uh, the joint orbit itself to four dimensional symmetry for this deformed submanifold. And uh, uh, as we'll see in the future, uh, this will be exactly what I would call a non 
holonomic analog of uh, Kelly's real surface. So this uh, is a bit, uh, uh, well, uh, strange, very explicit coordinate representation, but of a certain three dimensional sub manifold in P7 uh, with a uh, four dimensional symmetry algebra. But, well, naturally, there are many more such uh, sub manifolds. So, what's so special about this one? Uh, so, naturally, if we start with the system of PDEs, we don't get an arbitrary three dimensional sub manifold in P7, we get some special ones. And I recall in case uh, of similar uh, systems uh, in holonomic case, we ended up with uh, hyperbolic uh, hypersurfaces in P3. So, they were characterized by Certain, certain conditions on the second fundamental form. So we would want to come up with some kind of second fundamental form for such uh, submanifolds, even if the core dimension is much bigger. So what actually happens? So first of all, uh, we would be dealing not with arbitrary three-dimensional manifolds, but only with contact manifolds. All these submanifolds uh, carry a natural contact structure uh, on its span by X and Y. So next, uh, we can play the following game. And um, uh, so we'll be, uh, for each point uh, on this uh, uh, three-dimensional manifold embedded into P7, I recall, uh, we consider a certain oscillating flag, but we'll consider it in a weak manner. So if you normally uh, consider oscillating flags for um, submanifolds or varieties in PN, we take a tangent or a point itself, which is like, uh, that corresponds to a certain subspace or a line in, in PN. Then we take a tangent space that corresponds to another subspace. Then, then we start to differentiate the subspace along tangent directions and, until they fill in all the projective space. Here we do the same, but we uh, differentiate only the, along the directions X and Y. And these are the directions that, uh, um, well, using uh, that I uh, denote that, that span a T minus one plane. I uh, use the standard notation for filtered manifolds for T minus one M is a contact subspace in the tangent space of M and T minus two in this case would be the complete M. So I use here a bunch of identifications, as I said. So a point would be a line in P8, in, P in R8, sorry. Uh, then uh, a tangent space will, will be identified with a three-dimensional dim subspace in R8, uh, et cetera. So, so the flag will sit in R8, actually, uh, for each point. But then uh, if, we, uh, so if we play the standard trick for filtered manifolds. So if it, we consider graded subspace associated with a tangent space, in this case, it's, it's nothing but uh, a Heisenberg three-dimensional Lie algebra. It acts naturally on the graded space associated with this flag, escalating flag for each point P. And again, uh, an easy uh, computation shows that because we start with a, this very special system, uh, all these actions, uh, like graded actions, if you go from filtration to grading, will be equivalent. And they will be equivalent, they will look the same as uh, uh, actions of the unipotent or uh, uh, subalgebra G minus inside SL3R. So if you look at, at the Lie algebra SL3R, take um, the standard uh, like full barrel grading, if you wish, that uh, goes from minus two to two. So we grade uh, uh, the Lie algebra cells here, uh, well, we call full grading, I would say. Uh, then G minus will be exactly a three dimensional Heisenberg Lie algebra. So it will be uh, the space of, uh, well, strictly upper or strictly lower triangular matrices, depending on your point of view. And uh, this three-dimensional Heisenberg Lie algebra, or the subalgebra of all, uh, uh, strictly well, let, let's let's take strictly up triangular matrices. It acts on G. It acts exactly on eight-dimensional space. So it turns out that uh, we have this very special condition for our three-dimensional submanifolds. Uh, whatever point P on it we take. Uh, we get this, uh, 
that the, this action by vector fields is actually x and, x and y that span cont contact direction on the oscillating flag is the same as action of um, uh, g minus on g where g is a Salsary r. So in a way, uh, what we have that uh, all submanifolds we get are very special uh, in the following uh, definition. They all are, first of all, contact manifolds. Second, they all have a constant embedding symbol and symbol, and I'll come to the definition of this embedding symbol very soon. But in this case, um, in this particular case, it's just uh, uh, it just means that uh, uh, T P M three, so tangent space of M three viewed as a graded Lie algebra acts on the oscillating flag at each point exactly as. Uh, uh, G minus X on G, where G is a cell three. So, any questions at this point? No? Okay. So, in fact, this uh, this uh, characterization is kind of a generalization of the characterization of um, hyperbolic surfaces via second fundamental form. Uh, and if you think uh, how we define second fundamental form, it could also be defined in a very similar manner. So we, we look at the filtration, uh, oscillating filtration of a surface in P3 and how vector fields tangent to our hypersurface act on this filtration. And uh, we get naturally to a symmetric form that has to be of um, signature one, one. And, uh, and in the generalized picture, we have uh, this action replaced by the action of G minus on G, where G is a joint action, where G is a cell three. So, uh, so similar to uh, hyperbolic hypersurfaces in P3, uh, our contact submanifolds M3 in P7 will also carry uh, uh, two asymptotic directions inside the contact plane. Again, that's a bit of a work to to understand this, uh, but uh, it's, it's a simple actually computation in terms of universal enveloping algebra of G minus of uh, three dimensional Heisenberg Lie algebra to see that we get again uh, a certain uh, hyperbolic form on the contact plane and uh, or hyperbolic form, uh, symmetric form on a uh, two dimensional plane would define as two directions. And we again would call them asymptotic directions and we would get again two families of asymptotic curves as integral curves of these directions. Um, so for the flat case and by the flat case, I mean the highest root joint orbit of SL3. Again, we would have, uh, we have both families of asymptotic curves to be just lines, but it will be like lines in P7 or two dimensional subspaces in P8. Uh, and um, again, it's a very simple exercise to understand what would be these lines. Um, then for any uh, rank one nilpotent element inside uh, uh, SL3, uh, one of those lines will be all nilpotent elements having the same image uh, as this fixed one. And the other ones, all nilpotent elements having the same kernel. Um, so this is a, like a non-holonomic double ruling, generalizing double ruling of the hyperbolic quadrix in P3. Uh, and uh, if we do the same exercise for our deformed system, uh, that, that I would call hyperbolic generaliz uh, uh, sorry, non-holonomic generalization of Kelly's surface, then we again have uh, two families of asymptotic curves. And again, one family stays to be lines. So we have a ruling by lines, while the other one turns out again to be rational curves, but now they sit in certain linear hyper, uh, uh, sorry, in hyperspaces of P7. So they span uh, co-dimension one linear subspaces and they're rational curves in this spaces. So this is a kind of a generalization of a double vibration by lines and by rational curves for Keeley's world cubic. Uh, so 
let's now uh, think about how we can generalize all this and what kind of theory lies behind this generalization. And uh, what we actually deal with is exactly uh, non-trivial deformations of rational homogeneous varieties. So the um, hyperbolic uh, quadrics in P3 and adjoint orbits of SL3, uh, uh, well, close to joint orbit, like uh, highest weight joint orbit uh, of SL3, where particular cases of uh, rational homogeneous varieties. And, uh, I'll, and what we can try to, to do is to build a, a very similar picture. So we would uh, try to define the symbol of an embedding of an arbitrary filtered manifold and then would um, uh, want to deform rational homogeneous varieties in such, that, in such a way that this symbol is preserved. And see if you get any, any non-trivial uh, theory here. And that's actually uh, the subject that is um, that was studied uh, to some extent by earlier by in, in the works of Joseph uh, um, Landsberg and uh, I think Colleen Roblet, uh, as well as it appeared earlier in some uh, uh, works of uh, uh, Japanese mathematicians and then. Uh, uh, I think there was, uh, I give a reference to the work of uh, Hwang and Yamaguchi at the end of my talk. Uh, so uh, a general definitions and pictures would work like that. So we first of all start with filtered manifolds with the filtration uh, and then take an arbitrary flag manifold. So what we would want to consider, we would consider embeddings of filtered manifolds into flag manifolds. So we uh, generalize our three-dimensional contact manifolds to be an arbitrary filtered manifold, and we generalize projective spaces to be arbitrary flag uh, manifolds, flag varieties. Uh, the flag variety itself has a natural filtration, and I don't dwell into the details here. It's, uh, it's, it comes uh, again from uh, the uh, representation of the flag variety as a parabolic homogeneous space. So then we, we, we would want to consider uh, uh, embeddings. So we, we, we always consider embeddings. Uh, so at least uh, local embeddings of uh, our flag filtered manifolds into flag varieties. And we want them to be osculating. That is, they should preserve the filtrations. So we have filtration on uh, M on the tangent spaces of M. We have filtrations on the tangent spaces of the lack variety. So we want them to be map mapped one to another and the differential is injective. Uh, then actually it also turns out to be equivalent to this very nice condition that uh, if you take uh, uh, I's flag or J's flag uh, uh, in our embedding, and differentiate it along vector fields that sit inside i's tangent space to m, they would end up to be uh, in i plus, plus g's uh, subspace of uh, our embedding. Uh, so, and again, because of this condition, uh, we can play the standard takes coming from filter, uh, filtered, serial filtered manifolds. So we consider graded graded Lie algebras associated uh, with tangent spaces to M. And then uh, V itself, so the space where the flags leave, uh, at each point it will have its own osculating filtration uh, built by the flag, actually. Uh, so we have uh, that uh, a graded tangent space of M would act naturally uh, on the graded uh, field, uh, graded vector space V associated with a, with a fixed filtration where five X will be a fixed filtration at each point. And this is what we call exactly the symbol of an escalating embedding. Uh, we, we can potentially start with uh, just an embedding into Grassmann variety or projective space as we did before and then use these properties to build actually a flag uh, at each point. So actually five facts in this um, uh, picture is exactly the escalating flag uh, for the embedding. 
so what we would assume in the future that we want the, this uh, modules to be uh, equivalent to some fixed G minus module V uh, at each point. And this means that in particular, our manifold filtered manifold M would, would have also a fixed uh, symbol as well. So at each point uh, graded uh, Lie algebra TM should be isomorphic to the same uh, nilpotent Lie algebra, which we denote G minus. Uh, according to the conventions uh, coming from the serial filtered manifolds. Uh, so uh, if you now look at uh, the rational homogeneous varieties, so what are they? So if you take any uh, semi-simple V group G, take any its reducible representation, and uh, uh, then we fix an, ar uh, 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 an arbitrary uh, grading uh, on G and fixing grading is the same uh, um, uh, well, we actually we we can we can fix only parabolic, but let's let's assume we fix a grading actually on G. So we have a for the corresponding parabolic subgroup in the group G, and uh, uh, using the grading element sitting in G zero, we can also have a compatible grading on V itself. So both G and V would have gradings, and the, this action of G on V uh, will be compatible with these gradings. And then we can uh, just uh, act by P or by G, sorry, by the group G on a, on a fixed uh, um, flag corresponding to a fixed uh, grading here. So we have a grading, so we have a filtration. Um, so a sequence of uh, uh, subspaces, a flag, fixed flag. So we, we act by this on this flag by G and this would exactly be the escalating embedding we speak about. And these are exactly uh, rational homogeneous varieties here, or to be precise, osculating uh, flags for rational homogeneous varieties. Um, so what we would want to do, we actually would want to consider symbol preserving deformations of such rational homogeneous varieties. And uh, plus an additional property, we want this uh, um, deformations to have a symmetry algebra as big as possible, but not of maximal di dimension. So we clearly have homogeneous examples coming from this homogeneous varieties themselves, but we would want to deform them in a non-trivial way. So the symmetry algebra would drop, but uh, drop in a sub-maximal manner. Uh, so a very, uh, well, examples of such deformations would be exactly like all hyperbolic uh, uh, quadrix in P3 would be uh, uh, considered as non-trivial deformations uh, of uh, uh, the uh, action of SL2-2 or SL2 times SL2 on R2 um, times R2. And then Cayley's world cubic will be exactly such sub-maximal deformation. So first of all, it is non-trivial deformation. So it is not flat uh, uh, at the smooth points. And uh, uh, moreover, it's symmetry algebra is three-dimensional, so maximal possible uh, if we consider non-flat, among non-flat surfaces. And similarly, uh, the three-dimensional uh, manifold uh, V constructed in P7, that corresponds to the solution space of the equation x squared u equal to y u and y squared u equal to zero is exactly such unique deformation or like submaximal deformation of the highest root orbit of the joint representation of SL3. Again, it's some uh, work, but not extremely difficult. So it's purely algebraic, well, mostly algebraic computation to find out that this is exactly a unique submaximal deformation. So all other deformations uh, would have symmetry algebra at most three, while this one has exactly four. Um, so how this uh, generalizes, uh, how this goes further, and uh, I should say that uh, general theory is here, but the classification of such submaximal deformations is not known. So it is, uh, there are, I give the references to this works um, at the end of this paper. So invariants of such deformations are governed by a certain homogeneous, uh, a certain cohomology space. 
So this is exactly what kind of cohomology one would need to consider. So it's a first cohomology, first of all, of G minus with values in SLV uh, by G. And this resembles a bit the classical uh, theory, uh, classical um, results in parabolic geometry, where, where we would also treat parabolic geometry as a deformation of a parabolic homogeneous space. And we would have a, a second cohomology space, but slightly different. So it would be G minus with values in G. Here we have a different uh, cohomology space, uh, yet it fits uh, uh, nicely into Costin theorem. So for any particular um, example of a homogeneous variety that's easily computable. And uh, then uh, we would have non-trivial deformations uh, only if uh, such cohomology spaces do not vanish. But I say only if, so in general, we do not know if, if the reverse is true. Uh, what is known, so this cohomology is, uh, again, if you start computing this cohomology in, uh, uh, via Costan theorem, and at least in, in complexify the question. So of course we can go to, when we compute cohomology, we can complexify everything. And uh, in general, we'll speak about complex rational homogeneous varieties in fact. Um, then uh, we prove that such cohomology may be non-zero only if uh, our uh, model uh, spaces, so G by P are project, either projective space or quadric, or um, a flag of the specific type 1L in L plus one's dimensional space. So these are very specific cases. So actually in like, if you, in most of the, I'd say most of the racial homogeneous varieties are not deformable in a symbol, symbol preserving way. So there is no way to deform them and preserve a symbol. But uh, those may be deformed uh, at least there are some examples for uh, most of them, except maybe for flags uh, for arbitrary L. But uh, I would probably advertise the problem of classifying of such submaximal deformations. So uh, that probably serves as a good um, introduction to the talk, uh, at least uh, by the title and the abstract I've seen from Danny Zaire where he would uh, prove some results on submaximal uniqueness of submaximal deformations for uh, Cartan geometries or parabolic Cartan geometries. So this problem uh, I mentioned here is probably even easier, but still open. So for the moment, uh, uh, no one knows all possible generalizations of the scalar uh, cubic surface, I'd say. And uh, I'll stop here. So thank you. And here are the references, by the way, <laughs> including the original reference to Kelly's work. Um, okay, thank you, Boris, uh, for your talk. Uh, questions. Hi, Boris. That was a fantastic yep. talk. Loved it. Mm. Um, can I just uh, ask a quick question about the double fibration? Yep. Uh, maybe? Yeah, so um, maybe if you go back to this, this slide. Uh, where you talk about yep. double fibration. Yep. Um, uh, if you quotient, pass to the leaf space of either of those vibrations, what sort of structure do you get, I guess? Oh. That's a very good question. I don't know. You, you caught me by, yeah, I, I didn't try doing that. So, uh, well, we, we may address this problem purely algebraically because uh, we, uh, uh, it, in the flat case, in the flat case, uh, uh, what we get is exactly, um, so if you start with a parabolic geometry G by B by Borel, and uh, these two vibrations would correspond exactly to the leaves of the projections uh, of G by P1 and G by P2. But that happens only in the flat case. So in a non-flat case, that would be, well, probably some generalizations of this double vibration between parabolic geometries. But uh, in general, I I'm not sure what, what one can expect here. Yeah. Sorry, so this double vibration 
always exist in the class of uh, deformations that you uh, consider? Did I get that right? Yes, I'm, I'm just trying to get an analogy with like, you know, the, the statements in parabolic geometries where you know you, you, you can curve things up and you don't always, the, the double vibration doesn't always persist. Right. But this I don't know. So I know only that it always is present if you start from this system of PDs, then yes, we always have this double vibration inside the contact plane, inside the three-dimensional manifold. That will always be the case. And that is because we, uh, that is kind of uh, governed by the symbol. Uh, again, the existence of such double vibrations uh, is the consequence of the fact that we fix the symbol of the embedding. So, I would grasp that this should generalize to any deformations of uh, uh, rational varieties, rational homogeneous varieties, just for the same reason. But one needs some care to verify this. Okay. Um, I guess one small question about the cohomology. Um, so, uh, the, like, the, yeah. do you have non zero cohomology? Uh, like, is it, is it, like, do you have complete classifications of, like, the type? Uh, how high homogeneity you could have, or are they? Are yeah, they yeah. So uh, if you, uh, so I think uh, if you go to our paper with Mashid and Morimoto, the reference I gave at the end. So we do have this uh, estimates for the homogeneity. In most cases, it always comes from homogeneity one. Okay. If not all of them, I, I don't remember exactly. So it's non-zero only if these you're in these cases, but there are. Still, there could still be specific representations where representations yep. where it's zero. Exactly, exactly. For example, if you take uh, this flex of type one L and L plus one's dimensional space, this is in fact exactly the uh, adjoint varieties of the group uh, SL L plus one. Uh, so, if you consider just the joint representations, uh, then uh, uh, starting from L big, uh, bigger or equal to three, is all rigid. So there will be no deformations. But if you take different representations, then you may get non-zero cohomology. So this depends not only on G by P, of course, but by the representation you choose. So by the embedding of this uh, G by P into a certain uh, flag variety. I mean, it's amazing that the types of, uh, like, it's such a small list of GMPs that. I'm yeah, in case G simple. So if you try to start looking at the semi simple cases, this becomes a bit more complicated. Other questions? Okay, thank you very much, Boris. Thank you.